Good evening, barflies and lounge lizards. Welcome to the Wacky World Lounge. And tonight we're going to be discussing my favorite 1960s sci-fi films. Let's get right started. And number five on the list is The Time Machine from 1960, directed by George Powell. Based on the book by H.G. Wells, The Time Machine tells the story of an inventor, played by Rod Taylor, most famous probably for the birds, who invents a stationary time machine that takes him into the distant future, where mankind has split off into two different species, the kind and hippy dippy Eloy and the underground dwelling, very groovy hairdo, Morlocks. Now this is a really cool, inventive sci-fi film with a really nice look. I love the look of the film, the film quality itself, and a great cast. It also features Alan Young, who's probably most famous for Scrooge McDuck on DuckTales, but he was also Wilbur on Mr. Ed and a really cool effects too, like especially the time-lapse photography used in the time travel sequences, because as you know, as I was saying, it's a stationary time machine. So he sits in his chair and time speeds up around him. It just looks really cool, a really unique way of going about it. I've never read the original book, so I don't know if that's how it actually is in said book, or if they did that just for the effect of the movie. Either way, it is super cool. And then there's the Morlocks. The Morlocks have a great design. They like they should be hanging out with a rat fink or something, riding on a hot rod. Just really unique and really groovy for that time period. And it actually had a sort of sequel called Time Machine, The Journey Back. It's mostly a documentary, but it's broken up into segments. And then the last segment has a mini follow-up to The Time Machine, actually featuring Rod Taylor, Alan Young, and Whit Bissell repri reprising their roles from the film. And number four on the list is The Last Man on Earth from 1964, directed by two directors, a Sidney Salkow and a name I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Last Man on Earth is based on the book I Am Legend by Richard Matheson, and it tells the story of a Dr. Robert Morgan, uh, played by Vincent Price. So, I mean, that tells you right there. That really would tell me all I needed to know, but I'll, I'll continue in case someone's not sold yet, which I can't imagine you wouldn't be. But Vincent Price's character, Dr. Robert Morgan, basically tells the story of him trying to survive in a post-apocalyptic kind of world where a plague has turned everyone else into these strange, almost vampire-like creatures who want him dead. Now, many would probably argue that this is a horror movie. I can see that. I don't necessarily agree with that opinion, but I could definitely... That's one of those stances where I could definitely see where you could come from on that one. But to me, this is basically just good post-apocalyptic sci-fi fun with some virus movie elements. And it's just really a great film. It's tense. It's suspenseful. You really kind of don't know where it's going. And of course, it has an amazing performance by Vincent Price. I mean, I know that that kind of goes without saying, but of his amazing performances, this is one of his most amazing-ist performance. And interestingly enough, this was either the first or second Vincent Price film I ever bought on DVD. And just another little neat tidbit about this one is it's kind of non-linear. Long before non-linear filmmaking was kind of a trend, it kind of jumps around. You start out with the virus going full force and it kind of fills in the gaps later. And from what I read in my research for this one, this is actually still the most fateful adaption of the original book that's been made yet. Can't speak for that myself, but I would like to think that that is the case. And a little piece of trivia on this one is in the scene where Vincent Price, Dr. Robert Morgan, is lifting the corpses into the car. He wanted it to look realistic, and he wanted it to show how Dr. Morgan was struggling with what he was going through. So those are actually real people he's lifting and loading into the car. That's dedication right there. And number three on the list is Robinson Crusoe on Mars from 1964, directed by Byron Haskin. And Byron Haskin, you may know, also directed War of the Worlds. And this one was produced by George Powell. Remember when I mentioned him? Two back on the time machine? Right there. Uh, Robinson Crusoe on Mars tells the story of an astronaut played by Paul Manti who gets stranded on Mars by himself. And the film is basically just his quest for survival, him trying to stay alive on Mars. 
and kind of figuring out the weird mysteries of the planet. I don't want to say much more because I don't want to spoil anything. Because there is a kind of a mystery element to it too. Like you don't know what the heck's going on until he does. So yeah, very cool with that one. And this is a great film with some really tense moments. And it's really what started my love of isolation type films. Like say, Dawn and Dead, where it's one or a couple people. In this case, one for, or is it? who kind of have to survive or being trapped somewhere. Yeah, great stuff. It also stars Victor London and Adam West. I originally caught this one one Saturday afternoon after cartoons, and I didn't catch it in the very beginning. I just kind of came in when the character was there trying to find the monkey. Yeah, there's a monkey in it too. And I just was immediately enamored with it, and it just quickly became one of my all-time favorite sci-fi films. Even to this day, I caught it a few years back, and it held up just as well. Now, the original title for this film was actually Gravity Probe 1, Mars. But that they felt that sounded too much like a documentary, so they changed it to Robinson Crusoe and Mars. Which I guess that's probably was a good choice. But this is a must-see film. Out of everything I'm going to recommend or talk about on this list, I don't know if I'd say this one's the most obscure, but it's definitely the one I feel that the, less, the least of you have probably seen, and you absolutely must. And on that, we should take some kind of break. Hi, partner! Hi, fellas. Roy Rogers! Hey, that's a pretty tricky hat, isn't it? Partners, how would you like to surprise your pals like that? Well, you can with my new Roy Rogers Quick Shooter hat. It's by Ideal. And here's how the Quick Shooter hat works. Just press this secret button right here, and a replica of an authentic Western pistol pops out and fires. It's your secret weapon, even when they think you're unarmed. So get Ideal's new Roy Rogers Quick Shooter hat at your favorite store today and you'll always be ready for anything. Ask for Ideal's new Roy Rogers Quick Shooter hat. Number two on the list is Destroy All Monsters from 1968, directed by Ishiro Honda. When you're done with this, hop over to Wikipedia or IMDb and look up Ishiro Honda's resume. Wow, you will be impressed. But Destroy All Monsters tells the story of the distant future of 1999. The world is finally at peace, and all the Daikaiju are confined to Monster Island, or Monsterland, if you want to get more technical. But some pesky aliens show up and they start mind controlling the monsters and send them out to mess things up. But once the monsters break control, the aliens have to send out Ghidorah and a monster bash like you've never seen before takes place. This is my second favorite Godzilla film, period. Like across the board of any era, uh, Godzilla vs. Megalon being my all time favorite. And it was so cool. I mean, not only seeing so many monsters together battling, but seeing a bunch of obscure monsters too. Like, this is the first time I ever saw Kumonga, for example. Like, there's just a lot of ones I just never heard of before until I saw this one. And of all the, the old school Godzilla films, the Showa era, even though Godzilla vs. Megalon is my personal favorite, if I was to recommend a Godzilla movie to someone who'd never seen a Godzilla movie before, or someone who'd never seen a classic Godzilla movie before, this would be the one I would recommend. And this one was potentially, it was in the talks of being the final Godzilla movie believe it or not. But the success of it, of course, led to more. Even though from that point on, they kind of, Toho took a totally different direction with the way they release the films and stuff for quite some time. And this is actually, if you watch the chronology of the films, it's the final film in the Showa timeline. Yeah, great stuff. If you've never seen this one, check it out. And number one on the list, which I'm sure some of you have guessed, maybe Al, is Planet of the Apes from 1968, directed by Franklin J. Schaffner, with, even though it wasn't technically written by Rod Serling, 
it kind of was because one of the early drafts of the screenplay was by Rod Serling of The Twilight Zone. Now, Planet of the Apes was loosely based on a French novel, which name I'm not even going to try to pronounce, but it tells the story of a group of astronauts who find themselves on a somewhat primitive planet uh, that's run by evolved apes, where humans are mute primitives. So that's all really I'm going to say, because I'm assuming probably everyone watching this has seen this fantastic movie, but if you haven't, I don't want to spoil it for you, because it is good stuff. Now, this is one of the best sci-fi films of all time. Fantastic acting, the standout being, of course, Roddy McDowell. I mean, I'd say this was the house that built Roddy's really his career. I mean, he's done a lot, done a lot of fantastic roles, but this, Cornelius is the Roddy McDowell role. Roll, roll, roll. I always think about when I think of it. And I'd say something with the effects, they still hold up to this day. I mean, yeah, you had those new movies with the CG apes and stuff, and they looked cool. I will not take away from that. Those were good movies. But just these, the old practical makeup still looks great to this day. There's such expressiveness to them. I mean, just when they get angry, just the way Cornelius, his facial acting, fantastic. But I keep saying, yeah, it's Cornelius. Because he was Cornelius in the originals, then he played his son Caesar, and then the TV series was Galen, if I remember correctly. And this is one of my all-time favorite film series as well. The third one, Escape From, is actually my favorite. But, I mean, the first one is so very close. and such a good, just outstanding movie. Now, interestingly, in the novel, the apes are much more advanced. It's a more futuristic kind of society, but they kind of dumbed it down for simply budgetary reasons. Figured it'd be a lot cheaper to film a primitive society than a highly advanced ones. And with, I figure, with all the tons of ape makeup and the stuff they already had to do, just needed to cut a little corners. But it worked. I, I have to say, I think in the long run, it worked. Because we did kind of get to see that futuristic society in what was it, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, I believe it was, the one where Cornelius' son takes over. And that's all the time we have for this week. Please like, comment, subscribe, and keep it wacky. Wow.